Rees talk. Um, I'd like to welcome Adrian Collins, my colleague from Arup, to come and give us a talk about his experience in the Mercy Mudstone, Salt and Gypsum from his recent work working on HS2. He's um, recently retired, was it 2019, Adrian? Yeah. After oh, 40 years. Um, no, it's just gone back to the beginning. Uh, uh, click on the uh, um, uh, record bit and it suddenly uh, defaulted if you way just press, back. Yeah, just press the... Tessie! Which bit? E. Uh, just press the, the slideshow button at the top. Uh, so there was a... Is that better? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, sorry. I, I, there was something which came on the screen which I tried to get rid of, which sort of... I think it's just the record one, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. So anyway, um, yeah. So over to you then, Adrian. If everyone just make sure they go on mute and probably turns their cameras off. Uh, and then there'll be some time after the talk for some, some questions. Over to you, Adrian. Okay, right. Hopefully I don't get interrupted by the internet. The outline of this talk really is a brief introduction to the Mercy Mudstone with the geological context and background. So a few words about the history of research nomenclature and some comments on the mineralogy. Then the main part of the talk was talking about the salt deposits in the Cheshire Basin, the Stafford Basin and the Needwood Basin. And then I talk a bit about the gypsum, which was also the important part of the Mercy Mudstone and finished by some uh, examples from the Tutbury gypsum in the Needwood Basin. So um, I'm going to say a few introductory backgrounds about the Mercy Mudstone, that it is a non-marine aeolian stroke fluvial stroke alluvial sediment deposited under arid and desert conditions in the middle of the Pangaea supercontinent. It is predominantly a fine grain mud rock sediment reflecting low energy conditions of transport and deposition across a broad platform with very little topography in front of the deeply eroded Variscan Mountains to the south. Deposition took place in temporary lakes in sheets of silt and sand from flash floods and in temporary river channels. Much of the sediment input is from wind-blown dust reworked by occasional influxes of water. Much of this dust comprised silt-sized aggregates of clay minerals. Therefore, the Mercy Mountain is essentially an aeolian deposit. Thicker deposits accumulated in the rifted basins established during Sherwood sandstone times, and in the centres of some, or perhaps many of these depositional basins, Thick halite deposits accumulated in the middle part of the Mercy Mudstone sequence from occasional seawater incursions. And sulfate deposits, gypsum, and hydrite also important for forming an economic resource in places. So, a bit about nomenclature. Um, this is probably old hat to some people, but it was originally known as Corpin Mar, but the term became obsolete once it was realised in the 1960s. The UK Triassic sequence was not equivalent to the German Triassic sequence. And like the Sherwood Sandstone, the detail nomenclature of the Mercy Mudson has recently changed uh, following the publication of the formational framework for the Mercy Mudstone group in 2008. Previously, a series of formation names had become established for the East Midden Shelf, but for some of the Midland Basins, the Mercy Mudstone remained undivided. The 2008 publication established a sequence of formation names across all the depositional basins, mainly using the names previously used for the Wessex Basin. So you've got the Blue Anchor, Branskenard, and the Tarpoli Siltstone. And the form Halite formations then became members. Bit about the history of research. Again, this is a very brief canter because uh, I say that because it's widely encountered across the UK, especially in the Midlands, its engineering properties have been widely studied. Uh, the earliest published study was by the Road Research Laboratory in 1966 on the mineralogy from samples from road projects by uh, A.G. Davies, who were then subsequently 
put a PhD on this. Um, building on this PhD, Syria then followed this up with a research program at Birmingham University, and the following classic publications followed, which was Charno in 69 and the 73 Syria report. In 1998, Syria held a seminar in Dub. Derby on the engineering properties of the Mercy Mudstone Group. And following from this, they updated the 73 report in 2001 as Syria Report 570 by Charles and Foster. And the BGS did their bit from the engineering geology of the British rocks and soils. Um, so I mentioned the mineral, Mercy Mudstone mineralogy. Um, the Mercy Mudstone is not homogeneous. Some blocks are blocky with little structure. Other beds are laminated, sometimes with clear signs of fluvial reworking. And these differences show up in the mineralogy. So the blocky lithology, the clay minerals are dominant. With the laminated lithology, the clastic component, particularly the uh, evaporite component, seems to be a bit more dominant. Um, a third lithology is noted in the strata above the Stafford Halo member, which contains much more classic material and is dolomite cemented. Um, this strata would be more resistant to erosion. It's probably responsible for the elevated topography south of Stone of Peasley Bank. Um, this strata might be equivalent to the Arden Sandstone. Um, there is much more data out there now to form a mineralogical database for the Mercy Mudstone to supersede that from the 1960s, and I think this subject would warrant a separate talk. Um, so a bit about salt. The Mercy Mudstone sequence does contain evaporites of salt and halite. They generally occur in the middle parts of the Sidmouth Mudstone formation, not always in the same part of the sequence. Also, in some areas, uh, it does seem that the halite members do replace the Arden sandstone, or there might be an unconformity. The details of the evaporite strata are very variable. In parts of the Cheshire Basin, with a mining history, the strata sequence is well known. Similarly, in the Stafford Basin, where there was brine extraction into the 1960s, the strata sequence is fairly well known. However, in the Needwood Basin, the Cheshire Basin, south of Crewe, details are fragmentary. The evaporite strata are also present within the Worcester Basin at Droitwich, where the resultant brine springs were very important in Roman times. The evaporite deposits are rarely purely halite. There is usually a certain amount of interstitial mudstone. However, in the northern part of the Cheshire Basin, there are two horizons in the lower part of the Northwich Halot member with little or no impurities. That's the top rock and the bottom bed. All the historical mining focused on these beds, and the present Winsford mine has excavated the bottom bed beneath a very large area to the northeast of Middlewich. So this section mainly considers observations made during a mining filling project at Northwich a few years ago, and a brief reference is made to an area south of Crewe. So a brief history of Northwich. During pre-industrial times, brine in the Northwich area was extracted from shallow wells or pits along the River Dane, where natural brine was at or close to the surface. A boring for coal encountered a rock salt at a relatively shallow depth to northeast of Northwich in 1670. This discovery resulted in many small mines being sunk to the rock salt deposits in the Northwich area. The discovery of a lower bed of salt in 1779 resulted in a rapid phasing out of the top bed mines and the beginning of an extensive phase of mining in the lower bed that lasted throughout the 19th century and mining finally ceased in 1929. The advent of steam engines in the early 19th century resulted in a rapid increase in brine pumping from where brine was present, so that natural brine was virtually exhausted by the middle of the 19th century. This led to the practice of bastard brine pumping, whereby brine was extracted from flooded top and bottom bed mines, leading to widespread surface instability. Out in the 1930s. 
1875, the Winnington Works were established by Bruno Mons, the northwest of Northwich, and brine was extracted from a natural source until 1926. The new Cheshire Salt Works, the northeast of Northwich, continued to extract brine from a natural source until 2006. There was a perverse reluctance in the Northwich area to produce brine by dissolving mined halite and the practice of producing crystalline salt by evaporating brine persisted into modern times. The Lime Salt Works finally closed in 1986 and is now a museum. During the early 20th century, significant surface instability affected Northwich. It's a couple of examples. This is about the mining filling in the Northwich town centre. Uh, details of the salt and hail up beds in the Northwich area were obtained by a project to assess the stability of the remaining open mine workings beneath Northwich town centre and infill them. Arabs were involved with the infilling stage, which took place between 2005 and 2007. There was an opportunity to inspect some of the borehole core from the infilling boreholes. There were a few surprises. Brecciated strata was observed, as expected, in the Mercy Mudson above the Northwich Halite. However, on close inspection, zones of undisturbed strata were noted in between the brecciated zone. This observation suggested that the brecciation was pan-contemporaneous, i.e. of Triassic age, and not due to more recent solution processes forming a collapsed breccia on the mudstone salt interface, the classic wet rockhead. The granular mile or horse bean structure noted by miners in the 19th century was also seen. The granular structure appeared to reflect the presence of hard gypsiferous nodules. I should have the door right now and are indicated to be contemporaneous, like the brecciation, and not a residual of solution, at least within the study area. The top of the Mercy Mudstone, just above the North Hitch halite, was softened, reflecting the historical dissolution of the halite below. And just below the top of the North Hitch halite, sub-horizontal etched discontinuities were noted, reflecting the historical dissolution from brine pumping. And then there was a glacial channel. One of the important features at Northwich is the occurrence of a glacial channel eroded into the top of the Northwich halite. The natural solution front and the presence of brine appear to relate to this feature, where fresh water in the glacial channel sands comes into contact with the salt deposits. And they say there's a ground model here, but as this was commercial work, the opportunity to develop the ground model further and investigate the contact between the glacial channel and the salt deposits between Northwich Town Centre have never materialised. Frustratingly, there was talk of doing a phase of investigation to consider this, but Arrow were never commissioned to undertake it. And if it did happen, the consultant appointed never talked to us. So this piece of the jigsaw is missing. So these are some tentative conclusions and observations made from the, in 2008 from the Nor Northwich in filling work that the extraction of brine regionally, but probably mainly from the Winnington Works to the northwest of Northwich, is indicated to have drawn fresh water from the glacial channel directly into the halite deposits causing catastrophic surface settlement. Due to this, images of tilted and subsided buildings in Northwich Town Centre at the beginning of the 20th century are commonplace. It, it should be noted that the problems in Northwich Town Centre were not primarily due to mining or bastard brine pumping, as often quoted in the literature. Uh, and this is an important point. It is possible that the superimposition of natural solution processes associated with the glacial channel onto the pan contemporaneous traffic brecciation was unhelpful in the development of the concept of wet rockhead collapse breccia in the late 19th, early 20th century published literature, at least in the Northwich area. Um, this is some details in the Anderton area that Northwich is on the edge of the Cheshire salt deposits 
and the lensing out of the salt deposits to the northwest is reported by Stania in 1933 from late 19th century records. The interesting details suggest that the salt mudstone interface is probably not related to the current erosion cycle. Brine occurred in fissures and not on the salt mudstone contact. And this is perhaps a more accurate depiction of the interface between the salt and overlying mudstone is in places than previous published literature. No collapse pressure is reported, no solution re residue, the horse beans. And finally, there's a Northwich brine spring. The brine springs in Northwich along the River Dane were the original source of salt in pre-industrial times. These have long since disappeared due to years of past mining and brine pumping in the area. It is surprising, therefore, to find a present-day brine spring in the Anderton area, northwest of Northwich Town Centre. And now move on to the Cheshire Basin south of Crewe. Historically, there were brine springs along the valley of the River Weaver, especially at Nantwich, but none further east. However, there was a history of instability affecting the church of Wimberbury. In 1832, under excavation was used to stabilise the tower, the same technique recently used to stabilise the leading tower of Pisa. Further work was acquired in 1989 and a slight lean has been retained. Moreholes sunk in 1971 indicated 170 metres of drift overlying salt beds, i.e. a drift channel had been eroded into the halite deposits like at Northwich. The adjacent Wimbledon Moss has a floating raft of peat five metres thick overlying 30, over 30 metres of water as a result of salt solution subsidence. Recent deep boreholes have been sunk south of Crewe to investigate the interface between the glacier deposits and the Wilkinsley halite member. There were a few surprises. None of the boreholes to date have encountered as expected an interface between the Wilkesley Halot member and the glacial deposits. Instead, they have entered intact Mercy Mudstone strata beneath a very thick and variable glacial drift cover. Some boreholes have encountered halite belonging to the Wilkesley Halot member below about 20 to 45 metres of intact Mercy Mudstone. See example below, which is at 76.9 metres. There was no brine. Significantly, some brecciated fabric was noted in the Mercy Mudstone above the halite, but not immediately above the mudstone halite contact. This is an important observation in the context of what was noted at Northwich. It suggests that the occurrence of brecciated or collapsed strata above the halite strata is not necessarily an indication of ongoing or geologically recent natural solution processes. The Winsford mine is excavated into the lower part of the Northwich Halite member. It stands beneath a large area. It is noted that the Northwich Halite member lenses out as it approaches the major King Street fault to the east. However, no brine is reported on this interface, suggesting that the lensing out dates from the geological past, like at Anderton. The halite is worked by mechanical excavators of galleries, eight to nine metres high, 20 metres wide, with 20 metres square reporting pillars. It's quite an experience to go in there. We now move on from the Cheshire Basin to the Stafford Basin. Salt or halite accompanied by brine within the Mercy Mudstone strata of the Stafford Basin was discovered by accident in 1889 by boreholes just north of Stafford Town Centre sunk for water supply. The brine extraction commenced in 1893. This rapidly eclipsed the Shirleywich and Western areas to the east of Stafford where production had been in decline due to limited supply of brine. Production soon reached 80,000 tonnes per year and was sustained at this level for the early part of the 20th century. During this period, 
no adverse effects from the brine extraction were noted. However, following a short period of increased production in 1939, surface settlement to the south of the production borehole started to be noticed, affecting northern Stafford. The area expanded across much of northern Stafford during the 50s and 60s and was terminated by successful court action by the Lotus Shoe Factory in 1969. The shoe factory had suffered considerable subsidence damage. Borehole sunk for British salt in 1970 for a housing development on northeast Stafford, the Coat and Fields, have provided a reasonable amount of information on the Stafford Haylark member beneath Stafford. The Haylark beds were present in a sequence of strata of 15 to 14 metres thick, with the top of the halite at a depth of 60 to 100 metres. Above the halite beds, the geologists locking the boreholes frequently noted brecciated strata. Across the northern part of the Stafford Basin, halite deposits are indicated to be present at depth and at crop, and to investigate these deposits, a series of deep boreholes have been sunk. Two of these boreholes encountered the top of the halite at a depth of 105 metres, which was deeper than expected. The top of the halite was intact with no indication of solution disturbance. However, brecciated strata was encountered in the overlying strata as expected. It had a very similar character to brecciated strata in the Needwood Basin, which I shall talk about in a minute, and the Cheshire Basin already mentioned. This suggests that the brecciated strata perhaps should be considered part of the Stafford halite member in the Stafford and Needwood Basins. The zone of brecciated strata was thicker than expected, up to about 80 metres, suggesting that the overall Stafford halite member in the Stafford Basin, which is a brecciated strata plus halite, could be well over 100 metres thick, and the top of the brecciated strata was poorly defined. But cautiously crystalline gypsum was present, as seen in the Needwood and Cheshire Basins. I shall come on to that bit a bit later. So where do the brine come from? One of the mysteries of the Stafford Basin is the source of the brine that supplied the salt industry. And might I offer some personal tentative suggestions? In other areas, it is noted that brine is often associated with glacial channels eroded into the top of the salt deposits. There was a candidate for this in the Stafford area, the Doxy Marshes. And Stafford Wildlife, in their notes on Doxy Marshes, make the following observation. There are four main flashes on the marshes formed by subsidence during the salt extraction in Stafford's history. So pulling this together a bit, a deep glacial channel is indicated to underlay this area and was encountered by boreholes for the M6 Cresswell Viaduct. Borehole brine was noted in a historical basin within drift deposits near Stafford Station, also on the axis of this channel. The area of historic brine production is just east of this channel, and it may have tapped brine within it. None of the present-day areas of standing water within the Doxy Marshes are present on ordnance survey maps prior to the 1960s. And a recent subsidence is noted on the edge of the Doxy Marshes. This was noted in a car park access room adjacent to the Doxy Marshes. You won't see this today because a new road has been constructed across it. I don't want to say any more, but these are personal observations. And then move on to the Needwood Basin. And this is an extract from the published geological map of the southwest part of the Needwood Basin, showing the key borehole locations. The Backets Form Farm Borehole, the Chartley Borehole, the Shirley Witch Borehole, and also the Essex Bridge Borehole, which I'll mention in a minute. And superimposed on this is the approximate crop of the Tuckby gypsum, which has been extrapolated, and also the approximate crop of the Sturford Haylight member, uh, which has got some boreholes to give some uh, um, information on it. So the details of Stafford Haylock member within the Needwood Basin is provided by these three deep boreholes. 
The Chartley and Baggett's bar Park Ball Hole showed a slippery zone of mudstone with a minor halo at about 65 metres thick. And that these are both really quite old boreholes. However, the Shirleywich borehole was logged by a geologist in 1970 who made some useful observations. No in situ halite was observed. However, zones of pen contemporaneous breccia were noted with a 65 metre thick sequence of mudstone strata. Boreholes have been sunk to investigate the Needwood Basin Stafford Halart member. There were a few surprises, perhaps I shouldn't be surprised, it's in the context of what we've just been talking about, but no halite was present. However, the distinctive brecciated fabric was noted, as had already been described from this Shirleywich borehole, and also been noted in boreholes sunk in the Stafford and Cheshire Basin, so perhaps it shouldn't have been a surprise. In places, the breccia was re-cemented by gypsum and also possibly by dolomite. And notably, the gypsum was coarsely crystalline in places. Now I'm going to talk a bit about the brine springs on the southwest edge of the Needwood Basin. Historically, a strong brine spring was located on the southwest side of the River Trent watercourse to the southwest of Western. It supplied an important local salt industry. This feature was reported by Dr. Plot in his 1686 Natural History of Staffordshire. The 1775 Yates map of Stafford show an engine, pumping engine, on the site of the spring. However, during the early 19th century, it was reported that the brine from this source was diluted by freshwater incursion. This source was presumably degraded further by continued extraction of brine from boreholes to the northeast at Shirleywich and Western during the 19th century. There is no indication that brine spring exists today. But also, there are numerous other historical diffuse seepages along the River Trent Valley bottom producing local salt marsh ecosystems. There's also a medieval healing spring, the Well of St Erasmus. This spring was still visible in the early 19th century because Pitt in 1817 references when it was acknowledged to be clear and good and might still be beneficial. It was described as having no significant smell or taste, but was slightly yellowish in colour. The current location of this interesting feature is surprisingly unknown today. It may be adjacent to Ingestra Hall. Most of the diffuse seepages and salt marsh ecology have been overprinted by 20th century agriculture improvement. An area around Tixel has recently been inspected. The groundwater within the land drainage system was confirmed as being slightly saline. It also had a significant component of dissolved iron salts. The remaining area of salt marsh at pasture fields appears to be supplied from boreholes. It is a very sensitive site of scientific interest and is a fragment of a formerly extensive ecosystem. The Essex Bridge borehole was sunk in the Shugborough State in 1963. Uh, it accounted uh, saline water. However, there was scepticism about the results. The analysis said, I doubt it. However, subsequently, saline water in the Sherwood Sands in this area was seemingly confirmed by Geophysics in 1979. It's also noted briefly in this analysis that there was a reasonable sulfate component as well as the, uh, the chloride component. So this does get a little bit of uh, um, kind of overlap with what was seen at Tixor. So the presence of saline water in the Seward Sandstone east of Stafford is also suggested by the name of the village of Salt. See the plan. This location is actually underlined by Sherwood Sandstone Strata. So the source of the saline water intrusion into the Sherwood Sandstone is uncertain. It may be coming from the Stafford Halam member to the northeast, perhaps by an indirect pathway. I shall I mention a um, theory about this in a minute. The possibility of 
exploiting coal at depth in this area as an extension of the Cannock Chase coal field was considered in the 1970s, and numerous exploratory boreholes were sunk. At the time, one of the reasons for given for not pursuing this prospect was due to a high chloride content in the coal. There are several loose ends regarding saline groundwater in this area, like the seepage at Tixel and possibly even Serasmus Well. Now, this is where things get interesting. The subsurface memoir of the BGS Smith et al. 2005, the structure and evolution of the surface Pennine Basin adjacent areas, shows the sand and fault on the west side of the Needham Basin. When the sand and fault is plotted onto the 1 to 50,000 geological map, some interesting things are noted, features are noted. Many of the occurrences of brine on the southwest edge of the Needham Basin appear to be related to the sand and fault. This includes the St. Rasmus Well, the historical brine spring, a saline intrusion towards salt, and possibly the saline intrusion towards the Essex Bridge borehole. So this is a personal hypothesis to account for the occurrence of brine on the southwest edge of the Needwood Basin, that fresh water in the River Trent superficial deposits is underlain by brine in the top of the Stafford Halite member, and the sand and fault provides a pathway to the surface. And as already noted, during the early 19th century, it was reported that the brine from the historical spring was diluted by fresh water incursion, presumably from the overlying river gravels. This source was presumably degraded further by continued extraction of brine from boreholes to the northeast at Shirleywich and Western during the 19th century. And I say, as mentioned earlier, there is no indication that the historic brine spring exists today. Having talked about salt, I'm now going to move on to look about gypsum in the Mercia mudstone. But sulfate, gypsum and hydrite and carbonate, calcite and dolomite are important minor constituents of Mercia mudstone, often in the porosity as a cementing agent. It is observed that gypsum occurs in fibrous veins, one to 10 millimetres wide, commonly comprising about one to 5% of the rock mass. It is generally acknowledged that the gypsum has converted from anhydrite in the presence of water in near surface conditions. The fibrous crystal structure reflecting crystallization within an overburden stress field as the anhydrite gypsum conversion results in an increase in volume. However, near the surface, gypsum is removed by groundwater dissolution. And this then comes on to what I would describe as the importance of the solution front. Observations from, I say various, I say numerous projects across the West Midlands indicate that groundwater dissolution often forms a gypsum solution front, typically at depths of 20 to 30 metres, but shallower beneath the valley bottoms of the Tame and Trent, possibly, which is speculatively, due to late Pleistocene river erosion. The solution front is often, but always abrupt, and the quality of the recovered core across it often improves abruptly. Strata where the gypsum has been removed by solution is usually rubbly with close or very closely spaced discontinuities. Sometimes clay and fill, and it's often disturbed by the drilling process. Core loss occurs and RQD is poor. Just above the solution front, there is sometimes, I say perhaps occasionally, a zone of higher permeability. Below the solution front, where gypsum is visually present, the recovered core is usually clean, with little or no core loss and good RQD. The solution front phenomena is curiously underreported. Neither the BGS nor Syria mention it. 
This may be due to the depth that the front occurs, typically 20 to 30 metres. And many ground investigation boreholes in the past may not have been deep enough to intersect and report it. Boreholes in the Cheshire, Stafford and Needwood basins has observed gypsum in a variety of habits. I've also mentioned you see coarsely crystalline gypsum. You do see powdery or finely crystalline gypsum and also the fibrous uh, sort mentioned earlier. And rarely in the Stafford Basin, all these three habits are observed to occur together. So the coarsely crystalline gypsum, uh, the boreholes have encountered coarsely crystalline gypsum within the Stafford Halite member in the Stafford and Needwood Basins, particularly in zone where the halite appears to be removed soon after deposition. The source of the coarsely crystalline gypsum is currently unknown, but it does not look like it has come from anhydrite hydration. Likewise, the date of the gypsum mineralization is unknown. It may reflect a period in the geological past when sulfate rich groundwater was circulating below a paleo land surface, a subject for future consideration. Coarsely crystalline gypsum has also been encountered in Borhos in the Cheshire Basin, Mercy Mudstone. Here, it appears to occur in the upper part of Wilkesley Halot member, where the halot appears to be removed soon after deposition. And then you have the powdery gypsum. The powdery or finely crystalline gypsum has been observed to occur sporadically within the Mercy Mudstone weathering profile, sometimes at shallow depth and in notable quantities, particularly in the Stafford Basin, but not exclusively. Its occurrence implies that in places gypsum is being solutioned at the base of the weathering profile on the solution front and is being redeposited within the weathering profile. And this therefore appears to be a very recent or possible ongoing process. I shall move on to this final bit of talk to look at the Tuxbury gypsum. Towards the top of the Mercy Mudstone group, in the Branscombe Mudstone Formation, the Needle Basin, a significant gypsum deposit is present. The Tuckbridge gypsum forms a strata of almost pure gypsum, about three metres, perhaps a bit more in places, which has been mined for many years for plaster, plasterboard, cement, and I probably ought to add the currents of alabaster as well. The gypsum is in different in character from the more disseminated gypsum seen in the Mercy Mudstone strata in the Stafford and Cheshire Basin. It has had a complex depositional and diagenetic history that large inclusions of anhydrite are present. Some of the gypsum is finely crystalline, it's the alabaster. The gypsum is typically in small granular crystals, giving a, a sugary texture. I want to talk a bit about the Normans with gypsum mine, which is in the southwest part of the uh, Needwood Basin. The, the Tutby gypsum was worked underground between about 1930 and 1956, just east of Stowe. And there's a lot of exploration boreholes for this mine, and this indicated the Tutby gypsum is significantly affected by solution processes. And other boreholes on the southwest side of the Needwood Basin have also shown extensive dissolution of the Tuckbury gypsum. Many of the cast features are reported in the area um, are, are likely, possibly due to the solution of the Tuckbury gypsum and not the Stafford Halot member 60 metres below, although a connection cannot entirely be ruled out. The main feature that needs to be resisted is Chartley Moss which is adjacent to the gypsum mine. Um, this is a personal thought. It is considered unlikely that it is due to salt solution as reported into literature, because we have exploration boreholes, the gypsum mine nearest Chartley Moss, show that Tuckby gypsum to be five meters thick 
at a depth of just 15 metres, and Chartley Moss is reported to be about 12 metres deep. So therefore, the extensive solution of the Tuckby gypsum at shallow depth noted in the adjacent mine exploration boreholes is likely to be responsible for Chartley Moss and its recorded collapses, making a, a scenario perhaps similar to Ripon. The Tuckby gypsum is currently worked by the Fold gypsum mine and very extensive workings extend beneath the centre of the Needwood Basin to the rest of Burton-on-Trent. And these are a few images of these mine workings presented from a visit a few years ago, and I say, perhaps I should say many years ago. So this is a visiting party, and I think you might be able to spot a youthful John Perry there on the uh, um, left. It shows how long ago these were taken. So the excavation of the gypsum then was by blasting and then was excavated by uh, a machine. And the mine is worked by past extraction with large supporting pillars. The last picture is a close up showing that the gypsum, apart from the alabaster and hydrite masses, had quite a distinctive bedding aspect and samples collected had the granular character, which is different from the gypsum seen in the Stafford and Cheshire basins. And this is likely be due to the fact that the Tuckby gypsum has had a complex origin, um, being derived in Triassic times from the adjacent lower Carboniferous Hathen hydrite, and hydrite, and it was possibly initially gypsum, but later it would have been anhydrite during times of deep burial, and more recently geologically, when the Tuckby gypsum was at a shallow depth, rehydration has occurred which has caused diaperic intrusions into the overlying strata seen in parts of the mine. And say in the deeper parts of the uh, mine, there are still unrehydrated masses of anhydrite, which are still present. So finally, the conclusions. The brecciated fabric as is frequently observed above and associated with the halite beds in the Cheshire, Stafford and Needwood Basins is ind indicated to be pancontemporaneous, as noted by the Geological Survey in the Macclesfield Memoir. Its occurrence does not necessarily indicate ongoing or geologically recent natural solution processes. Ongoing and geologically recent natural solution processes probably occurs in places generating the wet rock head conditions of brine on the mudstone head at contact reported by many historical publications. However, this might be the exception rather than the rule. And then it is noted that many or most of the historical occurrences of brine actually relates to locations where glacial erosion has incised into halite deposits in Cheshire and Staffordshire. We are entering a new period of Mercy Mudstone research as more data becomes available. There is certainly a scope for a PhD project to consider traditional ideas and what has been called wet rockhead and the suggestion that other processes are involved, such as the impact of glacial erosion and pancontemporaneous solution and brecciation. And finally, in the southwest part of the Needwood Basin, the, the Tuckby gypsum and not the Stafford Halite member is likely to be responsible for karstic features like Chartley Moss. So th thank you very much. To say that this is sort of very much a, a personal canter through uh, Mercy Mudstone, Salt and Gypsum. Hopefully some of the observations have been interesting, but I'll be quite happy to uh, be grilled with some questions if uh, people wish to. Thanks, Adrian. Um, are there any questions? If so, just unmute yourself and fire away. <laughs> 